non-motor symptoms are just very important to recognize and treat, and, and I'll go through why. And it really is just kind of the top of the iceberg is what people see, the tremors, slow movements, and all these other symptoms are very, very important, uh, affect quality of life, and, and most of them have, have treatments. Um, there was a big study done once, about 1,200 patients, and basically everybody has a non-motor symptom, about 99% in this study, so, so very prevalent. Um, as mentioned, and I'll just say it too, some of these symptoms start even decades before uh, tremors or any other motor symptoms are noticed. So, so you might lose your sense of smell, become constipated, act out your dreams, have mood changes, and then some of these, again, maybe 10 to even 20 years before. You can kind of see that on a chart here. Constipation seems to be a very, very early possibility, and then the acting out dreams. And then once you develop kind of motor symptoms here in the middle, other things may or may not come over time. Um, and the more time that passes, kind of the more likely things are to develop, um, including more mood disorders, cognitive issues, and some of the autonomic things that uh, Dr. Singer already met, mentioned. Um, and this is a very just kind of busy chart. And all I'm going to say about it is, is the point is that the presence of any non-motor symptom kind of correlates with a decrement in quality of life, just to kind of highlight how important it is to find and treat these things, just, just having constipation alone or having urinary urgency. If you ask patients, people about it, it'll, it affects them greatly. Um, and another just point, an important one is, and this was mentioned by Dr. Hack, is, is thinking about the timing of your day when you're having these symptoms, including non-motor symptoms. So, so anxiety, panic attack, if this is happening as the medication's kind of worn off, that might be the issue. And then the treatment's really more dopamine or, or adding one of these extending agents that, that prevent this wearing off and then they prevent some of the non-motor features. And the same with the opposite. If you're on very dyskinetic, these involuntary dancing movements and also kind of manic, you know, all, it may, may be also related to, to too much dopamine and the treatment's not necessarily blocking, but, but altering the timing of the dose. So just to jump into mood, uh, I'll talk about anxiety, depression, and then a little bit about anhedonia that I think is under discussed. Um, but to start a cartoon, I hope it's not an insulting cartoon. I thought about it long and hard about putting this in, but, but it's important to ask the person, are you actually depressed? You might look depressed and not be depressed. And that's true of, of any emotion, but, but, but it's an important question because the treatment for kind of not having an expression isn't an SSRI. Uh, so, so just keep that in mind. Um, depression is very common in Parkinson's, probably up to a third of patients. I bet it's more have, have depressive symptoms, similar with anxiety, you know, probably at least half. Um, very common to have both. And both might be related to kind of chemical changes in the brain from the disease and also might just be a reflection of the, the symptoms that you're having and then a reaction to them. There's specific criteria for, for both. I won't belabor them, but, but just be aware that there's other symptoms besides depression associated with depression. Um, one important one that I'll go back to is this kind of loss of interest and pleasure that should be differentiated. Um, but a number of other things involved, some things that people don't always think about, changes in sleep habits, changes in appetite, more or less for both of those, maybe irritability, anger outbursts. So even not necessarily having a, I feel sad, but, but having this kind of complex of things could point you in the direction of a depressive syndrome. Um, anxiety also comes in a lot of flavors. Um, I mentioned panic attacks already. You can have anxiety about everything, you can have anxiety about certain things. Um, this whole spectrum is seen in Parkinson's. Um, and again, similar to depression, besides just that feeling of worry or anxiety, there's, there's other symptoms that can come with it. Difficulty concentrating, again, being irritable, just kind of being achy or sore, feeling palpitations at times. Um, not just that kind of subjective feeling of anxiety, but all this somatic stuff too. And treatment. Um, so there's treatment for everything. There's pills for everything. There's also not pills for some things. So, so, so helping with uh, sleep, adequate nutrition, regular exercise. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy, psychotherapy, just other things to consider for, for mood disorders. In addition to medications, the combo tends to work better. Um, some people are looking into things like magnetic stimulation through the skull too, to help with mood, but, but that's still kind of early in the world of research. And just to list some of the medications, they all have different classes. They work on different neurotransmitters. Um, some serve more than one purpose. I like to kind of mix and match. If you have a little bit of pain and depression, maybe a duloxetine for example. Um, so I always kind of consider the meds people are taking too when you're adding stuff because sometimes it doesn't play well. Um, and like I said, I want to talk a little bit extra about apathy. So, so this 
I have the definition up there, but basically a loss of kind of motivation to do kind of hobbies and other things that you used to like to do. And this is definitely one of the symptoms of depression, but it's also a symptom that can occur outside of depression and, and kind of similar to the expressionless face. Maybe ask, <laughs> is this lack of interest? Or are you truly depressed and also have lack of interest? And then there's all sorts of combinations. Um, this is one study from uh, Serbia, I think. So <laughs> 360 patients and seeing how many have apathy plus depression or one or the other. And I think the numbers are kind of important. So, so about a third with both about a third with neither. And interestingly, almost a quarter of just apathy, no depression. Um, and important to recognize because the treatment's different. So apathy has some evidence-based treatments, again, outside of pharmacological ones, exercise-based treatments, cognitive behavioral treatments, uh, mindfulness concepts. I always talk about scheduling in the clinic. I think that's a really helpful and relatively easy one. Keep a schedule and then maybe kind of force yourself to stick to it even if you don't feel like it, but it's on the schedule for the day. And in a sense that could treat apathy. There are some medications with kind of mild evidence for it. Uh, Rivastigmine's cognitive booster, the new pro patch, which has come up before, which is another dopamine agonist. This is an MAOI inhibitor that didn't come up before, but it's And just interesting, if you kind of dig into their tables and papers in the non-motor sphere, uh, mood and apathy was kind of listed as something that might improve with this drug too. So I just think it's fun to note, Zidago, also hard to get insured. So just moving along, um, after mood, here's cognition. So cognition is also a spectrum. Um, it could start with just kind of feeling like your memory is not so good, but nobody else can necessarily tell, but you know, maybe if you look really hard in neuropsych evaluation, you might find it. And that could progress to kind of more detectable, but not necessarily causing problems. And then kind of dementia is the end of that spectrum where the memory issues are there. They affect multiple kind of areas of cognition, but they really affect daily life. So the memory is now causing a problem, not just something that you notice. Um, just like all non-motor symptoms, impact quality of life, maybe more so than the motor symptoms in this case. Common problem in Parkinson's even early on, maybe mild symptoms in about a third of people with Parkinson's have cognitive issues from the beginning. And, and as I said before, with more time, more potential for, for that cognition to, to progress. And I think this is an important point when we get to treatment is that concurrent with dementia, depression's common, apathy's common, anxiety's common, hallucinations might develop and everything needs its own treatment. Um, and here's just a quick list of cognitive treatments. Now, combinations of non-pharmacologic and pharmacologic. Again, exercise and sleep, probably always a good idea. In terms of keeping cognition as stable as possible, controlling vascular risk factors, high blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, the healthier you are, the better. Uh, detect, think about sleep apnea and treat it. Same thing with neurogenic orthostatic hypotension. Cognition can also be kind of impacted during those low moments and over time maybe contribute to progression. Uh, treat the comorbid mood disorders. Look at the list of medicines you're taking. As mentioned, anticholinergics, get rid of them if you can. And then there's pills and patches and medications that can be prescribed to kind of give a little boost. And at the end, uh, hallucinations, the end of my talk. So, Parkinson's disease psychosis this is really a combination of hallucinations and delusions, usually visual, more common than anything else, but other things are possible. And all factors in your life contribute to the production of psychosis, including medications, Parkinson's and otherwise. If you get a urinary tract infection, it might develop hallucinations temporarily. The disease itself, of course, comorbid psychiatric illnesses. So, so this whole kind of subject all interplays with each other. Um, and it's worth addressing all, all the symptoms separately and then Maybe as a whole, things could improve. Hallucinations, like everything else, can progress. It might start with just kind of like a sensation, something is there in the corner of your eye. Then you might actually see more formed objects, but very aware that they're a hallucination. And then with progression, then kind of the loss of insight and, and, and more of a thought disorder if, if, if things progress. And, and important to nip it in the bud for that reason, because if you start a treatment early, maybe it won't progress as noticeably. Um, and, and, and just like everything else has to be recognized so you can treat it. This, this is an important predictor of kind of nursing home placement in the future. So, so it's very, you should be aggressive in treating these symptoms. If they're, if they're progressing, it's starting to interfere with life. Um, and these are also a combination, not just of, again, the disease itself, but the medications and everything. So keep it all in mind. And the treatment is based on that kind of Venn diagram. Um, so think about other issues, especially a quick change. If you weren't hallucinating yesterday and today you are, urinary tract infection. You don't have any other symptoms. You gotta like do a urinalysis. Um, if you started a new medication in the last week, obviously important to remember that and consider stopping it. Maybe it's the culprit, talk to your doctor about it. Um, and like everything else, other pills. 
I have a preference for river stigma in his first line. I just like it for hallucinations. I find it helpful, less side effects than some of the other uh, neuroleptic medications, to psychotics. Um, but there are drugs approved just for this in Parkinson's, like pemivancerin, which is also helpful. Sometimes takes a little bit of time to start working, but a very good drug. And that's it, just to summarize. Very common, very treatable potentially, very important to find so you can treat it. Um, and that's it. And I wasn't sure who was going to go first, but thank you, everybody. <laughs> um,